Welcome everybody to another edition of uh, GTD in Real Life. And today I'm joined by Imran Rayman, uh, who's the CEO of Kokoro. Um, I'll come back to that in a second, but Imran is someone I met uh, about, I don't know, it was probably eight or nine years ago, Imran here in a hotel lobby in Pimlico. Um, and we got together on the subject of GTD, which was a mutual passion back then. Uh, but Imran has been working as a coach for uh, at least a decade now and uh, at a very, very high level. He's working with senior teams around the world for the last I don't know, 15 or 20 years. And more recently, he's become the founder and CEO of Kokoro, which does employee experience and uh, uses the employee experience to help teams perform at a higher level. So there was some very, very obvious uh, overlap between what GTD does with individuals, what uh, I'm now doing with working on building on the individual level of GTD to go to teams. So I thought we'd uh, pull together and have a chat about uh, performance and experience uh, on teams. So over to you, Imran. Wow, that was an intro. Thank you so much for having me, Ed. Um, yeah, where should I begin? Um, what do you think would be a good place to begin? Or, um, you know, is it, I think the, um, one of the best questions you've always asked um, um, people in your environment is what is healthy high performance? And, and I think that is where it begins. It begins with um, the data we need to collect to ensure that we create environments where healthy high performance can happen. And I think we've done really well with KPIs, key performance indicators over many years. But I don't think if you take a more human centric approach, um, we've actually got all the data. Um, I think we've got a lot of what they call summative data. I think we've got a lot of validating data. And I think we've got a lot of blaming data. And blaming data for me is evaluation data. Um, and I think what we need going forward is more learning data, um, formative data, which is data that shows us the way forward. And I think finally, um, another part is what they call generative data, where people get data to help them have a better dialogue to generate new ideas or to have productive conflict around mm. concepts and ideas. It's, it's interesting because uh, I'm assuming it, it's a bit uh, like our business. We don't generally get a call when everything's working, right? If, if everything's working, people That's don't true. say, I, 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 need, I need GTD, I need efficiency, I need less stress, whatever. They just go, no, we're fine. Uh, I'm assuming that uh, if someone gets in touch with a company like Kokoro to do measurement, it's because they've decided there's something that's not right that they want to measure or correct. And very often there's a bigger pain is that um, current tools are not serving what their need is. Um, today, we need data continuously. It needs to be in real time. It needs to be transparent. It has to be the right areas we're measuring, the right data. We want to stay in touch. And it's going to be in continuous learning loops. And it shouldn't stop. Uh, why? Because anything that, need, anything that needs to be healthy is continuous work. That GDT is continuous work. It, you have your ups and downs. And it's a continuous conversation you have with yourself at an individual level. And then if you take it to the team level, and Kokoro focuses a lot on psychological safety, which for us is group trust. It's about you know, being able to make mistakes. It's being able to take risks. It's about asking for help. For me, very often when I look at psychological safety is it's looking at the speed of information in a team. Because if you know how information is acquired, if you know how information is then processed and redistributed, then you can actually see how psychological safety speeds up the team. So, and for those three things to happen with information, you need people to be able to speak up if something's not working. So it's all about group trust. So it all comes together, do you understand? So health for me, um, you don't do health once a week, you do health every day. Mm. Mm. So, so the, the psychological safety is, is an interesting one because it, it, it is coming up more and more um, as, as I move through organizations, this idea of psychological safety. And, um, and the place where I'm seeing it is, you know, how, how much is psychological safety the responsibility of the leader? How much it, is it of the individual in the team and how much is it of the team itself? Any yeah, thoughts well on that? Yeah, there's a lot of thought on that. Because the way I, I think it would be good to mention the other two aspects we look at as mm -hmm. well as part of Concordia when we're looking to build successful teams 
and getting leaders to create the environments in which healthy high performance can happen. So the one um, which I think is the quickest you can impact um, under the umbrella of employee experience is flow experiences. Um, it's something you can impact within an hour. You know, you, you do a quick session and people already think, oh God, this has impacted me. I've actually made a decision around how I wanna look at my calendar and use my calendar to ensure that I produce the best value for my team. Or even just if you're um, you know, one of those people in the organization that always works alone, then for yourself. So that's one area. Then you've got belonging and belonging is this whole idea of, you know, can you be who you want to be? Do you feel appreciated? Do you have, um, are you a cultural add to your organization or is your organization always asking you to fit in, um, which costs a lot of energy and actually destroys a lot of human potential. And the final one we mentioned first was psychological safety. So the reason I mentioned those three is because then you can say, well, which one's the easiest flow? Well, what comes second? Um, psychological safety, it's work, it's continuous to work, it's not easy. And the one that requires leadership in the organization to move on is belonging. So that then gives you an idea of what a leader's got to do. So yes, a leader has to set the stage. And I'm going to use Amy Edmondson's words here um, for, for psychological safety to begin. They've got to show that they are able to make a mistake, that they say, look, I don't know the answer. I'm sorry. There's one fundamental question in psychological safety I really like. And it is, can you say no in front of anybody in any context at any time in your organization? If you can't answer that question 100%, then you do not have a learning organization. The coefficient will not be good enough for you to say you have a learning organization. So the leader's role is to ensure they create a learning organization by showing their vulnerability first as a leader, by creating the stage. Very simple, to make this more hands-on. Mm. Are you giving your people voice? What does that mean? Um, that means if you have open ears, yeah, and people feel you have open ears as a leader, then you'll create a learning environment and people will perform and it'll be healthy performance. Mm. If your ears are closed as a leader and people go, yeah, you can say what you want to, to him or her, but they will do what they want to do. Um, closed ears create an environment of fear. People can still perform highly um, in a climate of fear, but they can't recover. Um, so the difference between a healthy, high performance environment and a toxic health performance environment can be open ears and closed ears. That's enough for a leader. Interesting. The, 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 I'm interested in, in the no piece because I, I think there's there's a real, it, this is where there's a nice interface with, with GTD yeah. is um, it's very difficult to say no enough if you don't know what you have on, right? So that's true at an individual level, but it's also true at a team level. And uh, one of the things that I'm exploring right now is, well, how does a team manage to say no often enough for its stakeholders so that it can focus on the highest priorities? Um, and as you say, if, if you, you don't have a no, then, then basically you don't have a safe environment. If, you, if you're not allowed to have a no, or if you don't have one because you can't muster one yourself, then your yes also means nothing. Right, because no, no one can tell whether you're going to deliver or not. Um, so, so there's there's a, a nice piece around the the interface between psychological safety and the ability to say no. Yes, of course, no is a very very important word um, for any team to be able to bring um, it to the surface and say, look, I don't think we should do this. And it's it is this whole idea of what's safe enough to try. I think very often our leaders or our team leads, or we've grown up, we've grown up in, a, in an environment. Um, and I think all of us, um, I think everybody listening knows this from school. It's, you're always expected to bring a solution and not a problem. So if you do have a problem, bring a yeah. solution. But yeah. that's where the mentality has actually taken us down the road of perfection. It's made us, you know, if I'm gonna go up to a leader and I gotta bring a solution with me, no, that's the wrong thinking, especially when the environment is, it's not, it's not volatile anymore. It's more than volatile. It's unpredictable. You do not know what's going to happen next day in current times. So what your leader needs to ask or what the team lead needs to ask is a very simple question. What's safe to try? What's safe to try next? Think about that question. I think it's a question people underestimate. But if you ask somebody, ask a child, what is safe to try? 
And they will go through it in their heads and say, well, look, I've gone through all the variables possible and to the best knowledge of our team and, and where we are today, this is a decision we can make. Then mm. um, they will make it. And what you do is you actually encourage them and, and um, empower them um, to make a decision because they know that they've done the best possible decision based on the current information they have. And that's what it's ultimately about. But if you go down the road of give me solutions, not problems, you're going to create more of a toxic environment because solution is driven by this whole thing that you've got to be right if you give me one. Mm, mm. Yeah, you get it, your ego, it, it, ego invested in the solution that you bring. Yeah, do you know what I mean? It, it, it underpins, um, um, I think, the worst part of waterfall technique, which is about I am knowledgeable enough, I am so experienced, I'm such a good expert, doesn't matter what context you put me in, I will know the right answer because I can mitigate all risks and you can't currently. No, you can't. No, no, no. You can't. You but can't. Let, 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 let's go on to flow because um, the flow is, I mean, I'm a, I'm a flow junkie from way back. Uh, love, 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 love flow experiences and um, have you know, spent a fair few years both, you know, re reading and researching and, and getting out and doing field research, obviously. Um, but I'm interested in, in, in flow as a concept for teams. I've seen some of the work that, uh, that Stephen Kotler's done on this. Um, it, do it doesn't seem to be easy to produce it or as reliably produced on a team as for individuals, but you may have a, a different sense of that. Um, I think we are becoming aware of it more and more. I think there are a lot of people who don't understand the concept of flow still. I don't think they realize the direct correlation to high performance, that when top people in any field, whether it's athletes, whether it's surgeons, I don't care what area, it's when they are in the zone, high performance itself is flow. Mm. It's this complete and utter absorption in an activity of task, a task in which you have found love. And what happens is um, your focus, you don't, you don't have to do this active exercise of focusing on something. And you don't have to think about the next task. It's almost like the oil the team needs to get going. And you keep working at making sure this oil that you have in the team is at its best quality. So, um, so that's what, what flow means for me in teams. And it's very often getting the team to stop. And one of the things we had with Cocodo was we realized that when people fill in questionnaires, um, the data would disappear. And you couldn't see where you are in the whole context. And it's your context. You own this context. So if you're not creating ownership through the data you provide them. And then what we did was simply, we just, on the, the, the visual graphics you get back from Kokoro, you can see where you are in all of it, anonymously and encrypted. So nobody else can see it. Oh, I can share it with you because it's on my phone or it's on my desktop. And I can say, Ed, do you want to have a discussion? Where are you in all this? Because once you get those discussions going, then people start looking for tools and saying, well, what could help us to, to, to improve this? And one thing we found with teams um, for the flow experience has been them collectively, and I'm gonna steal this from Jake Knapp now from his book, Make Time, um, is bulldozing the calendar. Um, if you think about it, if there's one thing teams need to do, I think, at the very beginning, you say, well, look, I make time for myself, but how do we make time for us as a team? And you got to do that by bulldozing the calendar. And that may be a very simple activity you can do in a couple of hours and saying, look, how much team do we need? How much time do we as a team need per week or every four weeks? Um, if you look at companies like Basecamp, if you look at GitLab, a lot of the virtual companies, they do all these sort of, um, you know, um, reflective sort of how you start the week, put down what you want to do for the week. Um, at the end of every day, write down a couple of bullet points so, you, so the team can see what everybody's up to. They're sharing information because once this starts happening, people understand what's happening. And then every six weeks, um, they do a heartbeat. And it's also written. Um, and what starts happening out of that is um, you start creating an idea of you know where you're heading. You've got focus. You know where you're going. Um, and then our little tool just keeps telling you where you are in all of this and what discussion you need to have or what you need to bring up in the next session or the next retrospective, the next post-mortem, um, whatever you want to call it. But we do get involved with the structures. And, and that's, what, that's one, of the, one of the triggers for flow is, is tight feedback loops. Yeah. So the, the tighter the feedback loop, and that's one of the things I, I love about, about your thing is that those, those feedback loops are very tight. They don't take a lot of time. 
and you you basically have a, a conversation going on um, with the the feeling of the team rather than waiting for a year or six months or whatever to find to find out what's going on. That's so um, true, Ed. That yeah. is so true because I want to I want to be a statistician for a little while because one wonderful person from Australia who was an actuarist at an insurance company gave me the the word space and it was. Um, those tight feedback loops, you call them, are called temporal comparison. It's comparing yourself to yourself over time. That's the mm. only way humans can grow. Any form of social comparison, what we sometimes call benchmarking. And I've got no issues with benchmarking industries, but don't benchmark teams. Unless I come to you and say, I want to compare my team to your team. And we give each other permission to look at it and discuss how we can learn from each other. That's not benchmarking. That is helping you to underpin your temporal comparison, you tight feedback loop with yourself. But what organizations currently are doing is saying, oh, you, we've got 50 teams. Oh, your team is in the bottom quartal. Is it quartal it's called? Of yeah. the statistics. So that doesn't create any encouraging environment. What it starts creating is the environment of competition. Um, and competition only works in an environment where the rules are the same for everybody. So when it comes down to the football league, when it comes down to support sports at the highest level, the rules are the same for everybody. Their competition is healthy. Um, in organizations, the rules are not the same for everybody. So whenever you do um, what they call social comparison in those sort of environments, you're not creating good competition at all. Mm. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Well, sh 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 shall we shall we move on to belonging? Because as as a third component of um, of a, I mean, I'm 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 exploring here as a way of measuring what's happening on the team in order to enhance performance. You found that this idea of belonging is important for individuals on the team. Yeah, because it's the most essential thing. It's the biggest preoccupation of the mind. Um, there's nobody in this world who's not preoccupied in where, 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 you know, about where they fit in. If there's, if you take a typical scene of somebody in a company canteen, getting their food, walking away from the cash desk where they've just paid for it, and they look left and they see their old team and think, God, I haven't seen them for a while, look right and look at their new team and think, okay, what do I do here? If I go to my old team, will the new team think I'm always going back to my old team? I go to my new team, would my old team think? <laughs> no, I'm too big for them. Um, yeah, exactly. He's ignoring us. He's gone, he's gone to a better place. Now, this is something that our mind is preoccupied with on a daily basis, even with the people we live with um, for many years at home. So it's the key thing and the pain of not belonging. If you feel left out is stronger than any other pain, even the pain of death, it's been measured by some of the best sort of um, universities in, in, in the world that look at concepts like compassion um, in animals and compassion in humans. There's not many people that look at that, but it's been measured. So that's why we took belonging because belonging is what creates the cohesion. Um, it's what creates um, the whole glue a team has and brings it together. And to measure it is really, really important. And it comes, and it's a big topic now. It's, you know, it's within, it's the problem I've always had with diversity equity and inclusion in organizations because it served the very few and never served the minorities. We always felt um, we were invited to the party. We always felt we were asked to dance, but we were never allowed to dance how we wanted to dance. And that is belonging. That mm. is true appreciation. And it, what it does, belonging then, it gets you to understand is how do we build structures that move us on from cultural fit to cultural add. So, and for that, a leader needs to have a point of view. And many of our leaders um, we have in top organizations have never felt left out. You can't be an inclusive leader until you've had the feeling of feeling left out, that mm. you've been excluded from something. Um, and I think that is one of the key issues. A lot of the people we pick, we pick for com confidence. And they're the ones that have never realized that all these micro moments of exclusion is what destroys the performance of a team. Interesting. It, I mean, the, 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 uh, the whole herd animal thing 
uh, starts to take on a real resonance. And, and then, of course, if you look back in history where, you know, exile was, you know, considered to be a, a punishment equivalent or worse than death because effectively you did die, right? You had no more community um, and you were sent away. So this it's, it's clearly a very, very powerful instinct in humans. Um, yeah, and I, I think this is something, you, you just mentioned a word which I think we're heading towards. So as we, you know, what, whatever type of organization you build, whether it's a centralized, decentralized, or a distributed organization where power and autonomy springs out of, um, out of the structure that is created by the people locally, um, you're going to have to start understanding in a highly unpredictable world that community is the only structure you've got as a leader. And you've got to build it. Um, and if you have not, if you see community as something which is driven, then you're going to struggle because it's not, it's grown. Mm. And if you start looking at transformation as a community um, and use community as the tool for it, you, you might actually start exploring new ways of leadership that you've never explored before um, and how community actually works. And you'll find that you, you don't have to go far. Um, in, if you're in the US, go to your local churches. Um, you'll find great communities and just observe and see what makes the community so powerful and so strong. Um, and look for the good in it. Um, um, go to other community centers where it's maybe not even not religious, it's around sports, where it's around local communities because there are certain types of minorities that are strong um, but small in certain federal states. We've got the same in the UK. We've got the same in Austria, where I live today. And these things can provide you a really, really clear idea of how belonging um, works and how they, what structures are necessary for leaders to create um, to help transformation happen, to help change happen. And so some of the leaders I'm currently accompanying, there's one um, I'll, I'll mention I think he got it spot on. Um, I asked him, I said, well, how do you see belonging? And he's in the area of digital architecture. And he said, I, as a leader, I'm trying to move the sense of belonging away from the hierarchy because people serve the hierarchy to um, the product and the customer. He wants to create a sense of belonging around the product and the customer. And I think that puts it into a really good perspective. We currently serve the hierarchy um, and our leaders create the sense of belonging around the hierarchy. So everybody serves the hierarchy. And then they say, well, people are just demanding and want things. Well, you've created the sense of belonging around the hierarchy. Why don't you start creating it around the product mm. and around the customer and then incentivize it through bonus programs that allow teams to get as much bonus as you do. Great. Great. So, so that, that's a useful place to segue into. Okay, so there's there there are some things that leaders can be doing around around this. Obviously, one is is to 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 measure to find out where they're at. What else would you suggest that a leader does in order to enhance flow, belonging, and psychological safety? Well, I mean, I think for psychological safety, it's definitely creating the stage. I've talked about you know um, you know giving people voice, giving them agency, um, and then seeing well how. Um, what behavior do you need to do as a leader to be vulnerable? You know, uh, what sentences do I say? So I create encouragement through building what I call in my language as a coach, not a vertical relationship where you praise and punish, but a horizontal relationship where um, you encourage. So looking at your whole language, that's psychological safety. I mean, belonging, belonging is a bit hard. It's difficult because you've got to be able to hold space. Um, if you haven't learned to hold space, that means hold tension in a room when you go against something because you have a good, a strong point of view. Um, a strong point of view might mean this. A young lady in a meeting, part of a team, says an idea um, and, the, and the team continues to just talk and not realize what the woman has said. 20 minutes later, a young male says the same idea and everybody jumps on the idea and says, what a great idea, Imran, you're fantastic, it's brilliant, let's go for this. And you as a team leader sitting there and, and, and you realize, hang on, Julie 20 minutes earlier said the same idea. Now, Julie would take that home as a micro moment of exclusion mm. and say, well, the, 
this isn't a team for me. You know, um, it's always the same. Man comes up with the idea, brilliant high fives around the room and we found a solution. My idea was exactly that idea, but I just said it in a different way. And what a leader needs to do, do there is to be the ally and say, no, hang on. Um, we heard that earlier, yeah. Yeah, great idea. But Julie mentioned this 20 minutes ago and I think she actually added two other things to it in how we could implement it. Could we bring those two ideas together? Um, and the only way to build belonging is by creating environments where um, you have allies. Um, there's a lovely book um, which I, I learned that from um, and it was called The Bystander Effect. Um, why humans don't act when they see injustice happen next to them, even if you know the people. And they'll brush it off by like saying, well, Imran didn't mean it like that. So they, they belittle the emotional experience other people have by othering and mm. by sameness making, you know, these sort of concepts that are used within belonging to show what people are doing. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's a lovely, lovely area. It's a bit more complicated and that's why belonging is an organizational responsibility. So whenever a decision is made and if DEI is not at the table, I question it. I go, why isn't DEI at the table? Why are people going around speaking to the public and they haven't included somebody who really has good knowledge of, of the concept of belongingness and how Sorry, to Sorry, DEI? Diversity, equity, and inclusion. Ah, that's, that's, okay. the, uh, that's the term I see being thrown around um, on LinkedIn and in literature all the time. And Got I it. find um, it's also giving it space. For me, um, to take the words of um, a social justice expert I know called Tiffany, um, diversity is a fact. Inclusion mm. and exclusion. Inclusion and exclusion is a choice. And that's what leaders do. Okay, and flow? Any anything you would suggest around oh, flow? Yeah, yeah, flow. Flow for me is it's one of the. Do you know, like here, I, I'd really like to stick to the rem remote environment. I think if you just Google the playbooks and the handbooks of GitLab and Basecamp, you will find a lot of information about how to create really good virtual environments with your teams. Because many organisations have just brought the office home. And they're trying to work on the same structures yeah. at home and are burning themselves out. All of us are. Yeah. And we're rubbish. Let's be honest to ourselves. We're rubbish at trying to set up structures that create the environments for asynchronous and synchronous work. And one of the things around flow is a good separation between them. So get, allow people to have moments of deep work. If you've got eight meetings back to back, You've got eight hours of meetings all day because your big boss and your big, 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 bigger boss wants you to be there, then you're doing it wrong. Hmm. Um, no, you don't. People should have moments of deep work and say that all of us have to have at least 20 hours of deep work per week. And like I think you mentioned before we began today, the City Group, who said no f Zoom Fridays. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that is um, a movement towards understanding asynchronous and synchronous working. And then using things, I think they call it forced function at GitLab, where you look at a tool. And what you do to the tool, you say is, look, I don't want people to store lots of um, files on this and use this as a file repository. Um, so what they do is they limit the amount of stuff that can be stored on Slack, for example, at GitLab. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, people yeah, use the yeah. tool for what it's meant to be. So you create forced, you force a function. Um, and one tool I know that's being misused is MS Teams as a depository. Yeah, we're seeing that ton of that. It's it's being used. Well, it's been a very powerful tool, been set free in the world with basically no instruction for its users. And so people are making it up. And we're having to come in and start to unpick what people have chosen to do with exactly. the tool because they're trying to they're trying to make it do things that it's actually there are better tools, right? They could be using better tools and they've just got this big thing and they're trying to make it do all kinds of handstands that it can't actually do very well. No. So, well, well, look, man, this is, this is fabulous, uh, fabulous. Really great to talk this through. Where, where can people find you if they want to find you? Well, they can find me on LinkedIn. Like you said, Imran Raymond. Um, they can also connect with me through um, at Ims Raymond, R-E-H-M-A-N on Twitter or through imran at bikokoro.com or visit our webpage, and, which is bikokoro.com and send us an email to info at bikokoro.com. Otherwise, they can also get in touch with you, Ed. 
Yeah, so I'm, I, I'm sure I will you. connect them up. So, but it's Bikokoro, B E K O K O R O. R O dot com. That's right. exactly. It's a Japanese word, which means the integration of the head, heart, and soul. Um, and the reason why we took that word is because um, in Japan, it also has a scientific um, sort of um, aspect in innovation where a product gets to a certain level of maturity where it has kokoro. That means it's in line with how the human functions in every part of its, 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 its existence. And we love that word. And it's nothing to do with the physical heart, um, which is another word in Japan, Japanese. Um, um, the, what the heart we look at when we look at the medical heart, you know, the human heart. So it's, it's, that's what kokoro is all about. Great stuff. Like it. Like it. Thanks again for coming by and um, Thanks for having me, look man. forward to next time. Take care. Thank you. <laughs>